All right, well, God bless you guys. Today we're continuing on in our series on the book of Revelation. And last time that we, uh, last time that we dove into this book, we were in chapter four. And what we saw in chapter four was a vision into the throne room of God. And we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the throne room and how God clearly set things up on heaven as, or sorry, set things up on earth as he has them in heaven, right? We saw a lot of imagery that uh, was used in the tabernacle and in the temple uh, scene also in God's throne room and that, that, that uh, in this vision that John had in chapter four of Revelation, right? We saw that God appeared as the gemstones that were on the breastplate. We saw the sea that was in front of God's throne that was also in front of the temple for ceremonial washing. Um, we saw that there were 24 elders that each had thrones in God's throne room, just like there were 24 leaders of the priesthood that we looked at in First Chronicles. And so today we're continuing on in that same vision and moving on into chapter five, we're still in the throne room of God. And again, I just want to reiterate that as we go through this series, we are looking at the book of Revelation as a futurist book, that the things that it's talking about and teaching about are primarily future events, and that we're, we're teaching from a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture position. And I just want to reiterate that at the beginning of every teaching, that those are our biases as we go through the book. And I also, again, want to reiterate that I am not an expert, um, but I believe that the Bible is meant for people who aren't experts, like you and me, to be able to read and understand and learn from it. So I'm going to teach you things that are wrong, but I'm doing my absolute best to teach you as right as I can. All right, so let's get into Revelation, uh, let's get into Revelation chapter 5. So what we're going to see today, this is the very beginning of the scroll with the seven seals. So we're going to get this imagery of Jesus as the lamb. We're going to see this scroll with seven seals. And I hope what you see as we go through this is an incredible, again, an incredible amount of Old Testament references. And I've tried in the first few parts of this uh, series to be, very, um, to be very focused on these Old Testament references. If you recall, I keep repeating this fact, if you recall, the book of Revelation is unique in the Old Testament in that it has over 200 references to the Old Testament, which beats the Gospel of Matthew and also the letter to the Hebrews. Not just beats them, it over doubles both of them. It almost three times um, their Old Testament references as the Gospel of Matthew. So a very Old Testament focused book, and we're going to see that again today. And then just like the end of chapter four, if you recall, there was a beautiful um, section of praise and worship to God and to uh, at the end of chapter four we're going to see that again here at the end of chapter five and we'll explain that a little bit and talk about why that should be inspiring to Christians and that's another thing that we've been talking about as we go through the series and we will again today and even though we believe that the book of Revelation is a futurist book that it's primarily talking about future events there are plenty of things that as we Christians read the book of Revelation it should impact our lives we should be inspired by the words that are on the page we should be inspired by the future events that are coming. So chapter five, we'll just start reading. We're going to go through verse by verse in chapter five. All right. So the first word is and. That tells you that we're building off of the last chapter. So and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written on the inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. And again, obviously we learned in chapter four that the person sitting on the throne is God. And we see him now on his throne, he's got an outstretched hand. He's holding this scroll in his hand. And it's got words on it, front and back, and it has seven seals. And obviously, there's all sorts of, um, there's all sorts of knowledge about the seven seals, right? People call them the seven seals of the apocalypse. But we're going to learn as we go into chapters 6 through 11 exactly what these seals are. And then we're going to talk about them quite a bit today because you may not know this, but the seven seals themselves are a huge reference to the Old Testament. We'll get there. All right. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a great voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Well, we're fortunate as readers. We already know the answer to this being Jesus Christ. Verse three, and no one in heaven or on earth or under earth was able to open the scroll or to look on it. So we, we talked as we went into Ephesians chapter one, we talked about the long poem that's in Ephesians chapter one. A lot of conversation in this fellowship and other STF fellowships has come up over sealing, 
and what sealing means, right? I'm sure you can think of the verse that we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Well, one of the things that came up in that conversation was who has the authority to break seals? And in kingly times, and even so still today, there's only two people who are allowed to open a piece of mail, right? If I put a piece of mail in the mailbox, the mailman isn't allowed to open it. You know, Joe Schmo isn't allowed to open it. I'm allowed to open it because I'm the one who sealed it. And the person who's receiving that piece of mail is allowed to open it because they're the one who it's addressed to. And in the same way, this was true in, you know, the first century and um, the time that John would have been seeing this vision. It was true in ancient times with kings and, uh, with, you know, uh, monarchies is that when a king put his seal on something, only he was allowed to open it and only the person who was receiving was allowed to open it unless the king gave that authority to somebody else, which you often saw. There was often a high chancellor who carried around um, a stamp or a signet ring who was allowed to seal and open mail on behalf of the king to you know, handle the affairs. And then he would bring the important ones to the king. So this verse says, uh, it, it, it says, no one on heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. Well, that's because God is the one who sealed it up, right? God is the one who has the power to open this. Um, God is the one who, he's the only one who has authority to break these seals. So verse four, it says, and I cried and cried, this is John crying, because no, uh, no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look in it. And as a human, right, John's a human being and he's in this vision, I can empathize with why he would cry. Imagine you're taken up in this, you know, no other way to say it other than a spiritual trance. You're looking in the throne room of God, and here's this gigantic cliffhanger sitting on the fingertips of God. There's this huge wealth and, of information and knowledge and power, and the vision just ends. Imagine what sort of cliffhanger that would be. That would cause me to tear up and cry too, but fortunately, we know that's not going to happen. And in verse five, it says, And one of the elders says to me, Stop crying. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the shoot from David, has overcome so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And this is probably the verse, the first verse that we'll really look at in, in great de detail. There's a lot of Old Testament stuff going on in here. Uh, it's a pretty important verse for the understanding of this vision. So we'll read that verse again. And one of the elders says to me, Stop crying. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the shoot from David, has overcome so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So there's three distinct parts of this verse that I want to look at. The first one is this uh, phrase, the lion from the tribe of Judah. The second one being the shoot of David. And the third one being so that he can open the seven seals. You know, we just talked about seals and it's apparent that uh, this lion, as it's described here in verse five, has authority to be able to break the seals. So the first one again is the lion from the tribe of Judah. And the verse I want, or the passage I want to look at from the Old Testament about this is in Genesis, Genesis chapter 49. So Genesis chapter 49, we see Jacob's, you know, Israel's last message to his sons. And looking at verses eight and nine, it says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub from the prey. My son, uh, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as a lioness. Who will rouse him up? Right. So the whole reason that we want to look at the Old Testament language, or you know, the Old Testament references here is because we want to know if this Messiah who we're about to find out has the authority to break the seals on the scroll that God himself put there, meets the expectations that the Old Testament sets. And we see here, obviously, that um, in, in Genesis, uh, Israel himself announced that, there would, that Judah would be a lion, uh, and then out of Judah would be a lion. And similarly, when we look at the phrase, the shoot of David, you know, I'm sure you can all think, uh, Betsy, that's Genesis 49, verses 8 and 9. Uh, so the next phrase, shoot of David, I'm sure most of you can already imagine uh, where we're going with this in Isaiah 11. 1. The first verse of uh, that chapter says, a shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse, 
and a branch from his roots will bear it, right? And shoot, obviously, same language, being, you know, tree-based language, and, you know, Jesse being um, uh, David's father, right? So a shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his uh, roots will bear fruit. So again, this language that's being used of Jesus here in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, matches that of the Old Testament. And this last part, so that he can open the seven seals. And perhaps at first glance, uh, you can't think of anything where it, it talks about Jesus being able to, you know, open seals or, you know, being the chancellor of God's documents. And it, it took me a while to, to think in, and to find one of this. But thankful for, if you haven't heard my dad's teaching on the book of Haggai, uh, which is a fantastic teaching. Uh, I believe it's still posted on our YouTube page. I would go back and listen to that teaching if I were you, because it is, it's very powerful. And that's where we'll be going for this. Um, but the question is, did Israel expect the Messiah to act as the chancellor of God's documents, to be able to have that same authority that he can break seals that God himself uh, sealed? And we'll answer, the answer is yes. So if you go to the book of Haggai and go to the last two verses, so Haggai chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. This is God giving words to Haggai. He says, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders will come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says Yahweh of armies, Yahweh of hosts, Will I take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel? And this Zerubbabel is the governor of Judah. And Shealtiel is uh, mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. So I, will I take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says Yahweh of armies? And I will make you as a signet for the one, or for I have chosen you, says Yahweh of armies. Sorry, it says, says Yahweh. And I will make you as a signet for I have chosen you, says Yahweh of armies. And it, this is a promise that the Messiah, or that the Messiah would act as the signet ring of God. So literally, it's the exact same language that, that's used, right? That God has the signet ring that a person would take and they would pour hot wax on an envelope or a scroll. And they would dip that signet ring in it to act as a seal and to act as a symbol of who, who sealed it. And that this, uh, this prophecy given in the Old Testament, shows that the Messiah would have that authority to act as the signet ring, to act as the chancellor of God's documents. So we see that in this vision here in Revelation, that these three different aspects of this verse in chapter 5 that describe Jesus and his power and authority were, should have been anticipated. We can go back and we can look at the Old Testament and we can anticipate these characteristics of the Christ um, in his anointed state. So that's verse five. Very good, very powerful verse. Lots of, lots of good info. So verse six, and in the middle of the throne area and the four living creatures, which we read about in chapter four, and in the middle of the elders, I saw a lamb standing, looking as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. So uh, definitely an interesting picture, right? Um, seven eyes, seven horns on a lamb that looks like it's been killed. So there's obviously a lot going on here. And the first thing that's worth pointing out is if we go back to verse five, the angel says, stop crying and look, there is a lion out of the tribe of Judah. And then here in verse six, when John turns around, what does he see? He sees a lamb and this lamb has seven eyes and it has seven or horns. So this is obviously a, a, you know, there's obviously a lot of figures of speech going on here. This isn't a literal, um, this isn't something that we should take literally, right? We don't believe, we don't look at our church symbols. We don't look at Jesus as being um, a dead lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. We look at him, you know, people have him up on a crucifix. We think of Jesus as somebody coming out of an empty tomb. This is not a symbol that we hang our faith on. This is a figure that's trying to explain something to us about who Jesus is in his anointed state, right? So uh, let's read the verse again. And in the middle of the throne area and of the four living creatures, in the middle of the elders, I saw a lamb uh, looking as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God 
sent out to all the earth. So um, seven horns and seven eyes. Let's just talk about that now. Again, obviously not literal. Lambs don't have seven eyes. They don't have seven horns. But we know that Jesus is this a, he was, he is the sacrificial lamb, a perfect creature without blemish. Uh, and that, you know, that's how he functioned before ascending into heaven and taking the throne. The number seven, we know, is a very spiritual number. I mean, it's a number for spiritual completeness. Eyes are explained. We'll talk about that in a bit. But the horns, uh, the horn is, has been and is a symbol, a figure for power. Um, and there are some biblical, you have to go into the Hebrew language to be able to derive this. We're not going to do that in this fellowship where you can see um, light, the word for light uh, and light coming out as beams and rays is the same word um, for horn. Those two things are the same word. Uh, and there's some other references where horns obviously show power in practicality. We know this, right? Bulls, they have horns. We think of them as a powerful animal. Um, you think of like Vikings, they would have steel helmets and they would put horns on them. That was a sign of power. Horns are a sign of power. So what this is saying, this particular symbol, is suggesting that Jesus Christ, even though he was a sacrificial lamb, somebody who went and he died on the cross, he now has complete power. And we know this, right? After the resurrection, Jesus comes back and he says uh, in Matthew 28, 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? So this is a vision of, of Jesus in his complete power. He's a, he's a sacrificial lamb that's dead that John's seen in this vision, but he has complete power. That's why he has seven horns. What's neat in Revelation every now and then you get a verse, you get a, a figure that the text tells you what it is. And we see that with regarding the seven eyes. Now the verse tells us what the seven eyes are. They're the seven spirits of God. And we saw them before they sit in the throne room. Christ now has authority over those seven spirits to use them for the purposes of the Christian church. You know, I think sometimes, you know, we talked about this last, you know, when we were reviewing chapter four. Yes, Dean just sent a message. The seven horns are significant of both power and authority, I believe. And I agree with you, you know, that Jesus now, this is a symbol showing that Jesus has all power or all authority and all power in heaven and on earth. Um, I think sometimes as a continuing on with what I was saying is that we underplay how much is going on in the heavenlies. It's obviously a very busy place. Um, gosh, I know my office is a busy place, you know, phone calls, sending up people to go do work, uh, questions coming in. Can you imagine what that phone line is in the heavenlies? It's going to, it's obviously very busy. All right. So that's verse six. I hope that you can read that vision this peculiar image of a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes looking as it had been slain. Hope you can read that with some good understanding now. So verse seven, this is also an important verse. Verse seven, it says, and he came, this is talking about uh, the lamb, and he came and he takes it out of the right hand of, of him who sat on the throne. It's talking about the scroll. So Jesus, he goes up to the throne and the grammar here is peculiar, right? When you read it in the REV, it says, and he came and he takes it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And for us, if we were going to be telling a story, we would definitely say this in past tense. He came and he took. That's not what it says here. It says he came and he takes it out of the right hand. And the Greek tense here is called the perfect tense. And I think this really should put a very strong perspective on how we're reading this vision. The perfect tense is for something that is currently happening. It's when we would use a participle um, in, in English. So another way to say this would be that he is taking, or something to that effect, that it's still currently happening. And when we talk about kingdom vocabulary, and we've talked about that a lot in this fellowship, about already but not yet theology, that when Jesus came on earth, and he said that the kingdom of God is at hand, that he wasn't lying, that the kingdom is inaugurated through him and that it is here now. This same vocabulary, I think, is very true. 
you know, what we're going to be reading continuing on as Jesus opens up these seals, this vision is something that is already but not yet. What we're looking at so far in verses four and five, this doesn't necessarily have to be future, or I should say chapters four and five. This doesn't have to be future. This is an image of Christ in the throne room of God, showing that he has full power and authority that was given to him by God. That this isn't something that has to be a future event. Um, so when we read this verse seven and we see this interesting vocabulary that Christ is taking the scroll or he takes it uh, in the perfect tense out of God's hand, that should be enlightening to us. That should be, that should give us a clue as to how uh, we're tying in our already but not yet theology, our kingdom vocabulary with how we're reading the book of Revelation. All right, verse eight. And when he had the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones. And we'll continue reading verse nine. And they were singing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and people and nation. A very powerful verse. Um, I want to focus on a kind of a minor detail in this verse. Obviously, there's a lot to say, right? It's talking about the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. It's uh, the fact that these highly powered spiritual beings would look at Jesus and say, you are the worthy one to take and open the scroll. That's obviously very powerful. But what I want to focus on in this verse is the phrase new song. And for those of you who know me, obviously one of my favorite Christian artists is Audrey Assad. And she has a song called New Song. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. If we, it's easy to forget that there are a lot of songs in the Bible outside of the book of Psalms. There's tons. And they all seem to come at similar times. Uh, most, many of them are laments, right? There's songs of sadness. But another great handful of them are songs of victory and triumph. And so if you, you think of right after God delivers Israel out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 15, there's a great song to God where Israel calls him their great and or Israel calls God their great and mighty warrior. And uh, similar, it, similarly, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses writes or he sings another song to God uh, right before they get to go into the land of Canaan. You know, God delivers them into Canaan. In Judges chapter 5, after Deborah's army with uh, uh, Barak or Baruch defeats some Canaanites, they write a song. They sing a new song to God. Um, after David defeats Goliath, there's a new song. After God delivers David from Saul, there's a new song. And for so many Christians, we, you know, we struggle with different sins. We struggle with different shortcomings. And when you finally beat it, when you finally overcome the thing that you've been struggling with, if it's addiction or, you know, you just, you know, your bad vocabulary, something like that, when you overcome it and knowing that God was there to help you and that the Lord Jesus Christ was there to help you the entire time and work you through it and coach you through it and not condemn you when you made mistakes, that feeling and there's no other words to describe it other than a new song in your mouth, a new song in your heart. And that's why, um, you know, I love Psalm 40, verse 3. It says, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And that's exactly what it is, right? When God or the Lord Jesus push us through something that we're struggling with, and we get to the end and we feel as though we are conquerors, it's, it's as if he put a new song on our lips. Right? There's nothing you can say except thank you and that God is holy, and that God is good. He does this for us. We experience that. So as we're in this vision, and I want to tie that back into what we're reading here in Revelation. We're in this vision now, in the book of Revelation, we're talking about Jesus Christ, who has ascended into the heavenlies. He's in the throne room of God. He's taken all power and authority. He has now got the scroll that God sealed up in his hand, and he did that by being the sacrificial lamb who... Um, atoned for all of our sins and he delivered all of earth's people out of sin and death this is obviously time for a new song right and so verses 9 and 10 
Versus, thank you, Michelle, for the time, the time check. Verses nine and ten give us that song. It says you, and uh, we'll read it. it. Says you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language, and people and nation, and made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on earth. A great song. You know, it, you know, it doesn't um, have a ring to it when we read it in English, but truly a great song, something that we should all have in our hearts as the truth, that this is what Jesus Christ did and accomplished. All right, so we're getting towards the end here. I want to read the last four verses as a group, similarly to how we concluded chapter five, or sorry, chapter four, because uh, they function the same way. The end of chapter four for Christians functioned as a reminder of the sort of phrase and glory and honor and power that we should be attributing to God. We're going to see that here again as we finish up uh, chapter 5. All right, so verse 10, or verse 11, sorry. And I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a great voice, worthy is the lamb who has been slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every creative thing that is in the heavens and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and everything that is in them i heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped so we see again this is very similar to the way that chapter four ended and it you know, I saw Sandy there. She threw her arms up in the air and, uh, you know, in celebration. And that's what we should be doing, right? I mean, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels and angelic and spiritual beings are up in the heavens, like screaming praise and songs over the fact that there's finally somebody who is able to walk up to the throne of God and take the scroll and redeem these wretched people on earth to become a kingdom of priests to God, just like he intended. Like, it's so easy as we walk through our everyday lives as Christians to just forget how great the plan was and how great Jesus's atoning sacrifice and Jesus's life on earth and the way that God is honoring him, how great and truly awesome that is. Um, you know, so many times we are alone, we're in our car, we're by ourselves, right? And it, it's hard to imagine ten thousands of ten thousands of people at that moment praying and worshiping and praising God for what He's done. But that's we should want to be partakers in that. And how many times do we just listen to cruddy music on the radio or sit there in silence or think about work when we really should be thinking about something else? We have so much time in our lives that we could spend if we really set our minds to it, to adding in so that it could be ten thousand times ten thousand and one beings praying and praising God and Jesus for what they are and who they are and what they have done. So um, that's all for today. The next six chapters, now we're actually going to see the scrolls being popped open. You know, Jesus now in his full power and authority, he's going to exert that full power and authority by breaking open this document and looking at it. So God bless you, and I will see you next time.